Hello, lovely to be back here. Right, um, this time last year, uh, I was talking to you about Cool Earth, which is a rainforest charity unlike any other. We've turned the conventional conservation model on its head. We willfully circumvent government, it seems, at every level and focus instead on the individuals, the families, the villages that have done the most extraordinary job of being custodians of the rainforest for many generations. But with the onset of the cash economy, with new outbreaks of malaria, with El Nino floods washing away their food gardens and four out of five kids suffering from malnutrition need a helping hand. And what Cool Earth does is something very, very simple. We form partnerships whereby we help build livelihoods that will actually ensure that the rainforest is worth a great deal more for them than it could ever be to a logger, and more importantly, creates a sustainable income so they remain in control of their rainforest. And it's worked well, thanks to um, the efforts of an extraordinary team in Congo, Peru, and Papua New Guinea. Uh, we have now, I'm delighted to say, more rainforest under community control than any other NGO, any other government in the world. But actually, that's not why I'm here today. I'm here today to talk a bit about the gruelling process that is TEDx. Um, you've seen some extraordinary talks today, you're going to see a few more, and it seems as though they're absolute walks in the park for these very confident presenters, but I assure you uh, there's a lot more going on under the surface. And it is a, uh, a difficult and time-consuming process that Claire and her excellent team do to boil down your message into a pithy 15 minutes. Um, and what I want to talk about is the effect that that's had on Cool Earth, and I suspect a lot of other small organisations that get their 15 minutes of fame. Because when you do boil things down, um, a few truths come to the surface. Not least, uh, the awful admission of mission creep, and the things that your organization suddenly now finds itself doing, which really weren't in the original instructions. Um, things that you do because other charities do them. Things that you do because they seemed a good idea at the time, and it was such a nice person who suggested it. So when we were looking at putting together this TED Talk, we actually realized we've got a prune things back, and that's exactly what we did, and we did quite a bit of spring cleaning. And we stopped doing certain things. We stopped telling, for example, uh, our community partners how to spend the money we gave them. We always tried to avoid it, but we actually really stepped back and said, look, this is your cash, it's your rainforest, what's going to work best for your communities? Equally, we, um, and this is a brave thing to do, we uh, stopped employing so many people in the UK. We employed far, far more people now in Peru, Congo, and Papua New Guinea. As you'd expect, because it's them on the ground that'll actually have the biggest impact. And then the other thing we did is insist that every single partnership had an exit date. Now, of those three things, I'm sure you can understand the first two very easily. In particular, um, making sure that Cesar Bustamante, who you may remember from last year, he's a guy who's going to know a great deal more about investing in cacao pruning than I am, so it makes sense for him to have the money. And why, oh why, were we going out there every four months? I mean, even our parents don't have to suffer that regular contact. Um, but the really important thing was the exit strategy. Actually understanding that for all development NGOs, the enthusiasm, the excitement, the funding in the early years of a partnership actually are the bits that you've got to recognize are good fun, but you have to plan your out way out of. Because unless you have a date when you're going to leave, things will limp along. The funding will gradually decline. Unless you have a date in the diary when you're actually going to say thank you and goodbye, you're going to create the dependency that will probably unravel all the terrific things that you've put together. So now, every single partnership we have, we know year five, we would have left them in a far better position than they've been at, uh, in when we first started working with them. But ultimately, it's their rainforest and it's their um, livelihoods that they will develop. And this has worked very, very well. And we put it into place, and you seem to be quite enthusiastic about this. And this time last year, um, the TEDx audience uh, protected 1,000 acres of rainforest in our Papua New Guinea project, which we're overwhelmed by. That day, we had more regular givers sign up than we've ever had before, ever. And the fantastic thing is, all bar one, you're still with us, and we will chase that person down. <laughs> <laughs> but it also gave us a calling card. It gave us a video, because me drooling over a, a PowerPoint is not the most exciting thing for people to get. So actually having a nice video we could send out opened up new markets for us. So we're now a registered charity in the US. We're talking to foundations we couldn't have possibly got hold of before. We have Disney. Um, now funding some fantastic biodiversity work. And we have the Michael Oren Foundation, who through an extraordinary generous gift linked to our TEDx talk, is now covering absolutely every penny of our overhead this year. 
So anything that we collect in 2016 will bring it directly to our partnerships in the rainforest. And as a result, um, it's only four months into the year, we'll be 40% up. So this is really just uh, to say thank you to the TEDx team and the TEDx audience. And you really just demonstrate that uh, when you say, talk about inspiring change, it's not really just in the audiences, it's also in the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you.